Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all this morning. A warm welcome to Kimmel Bay Church this morning. If it's your first time here, I'm very pleased to meet you. Um, and if you come every week, it's great to see you as well. And a warm welcome to anybody that's joining us online. This morning was a bit of a nightmare. The screens weren't working. This wasn't working. The camera wasn't working. Elaine just went to press record and that wasn't working. So um, I said, stop trying to give me a heart attack, Elaine. <laughs> um, I've got written down here a special welcome to Gordon and Ali. Does anybody know of Gordon and Ali here? <laughs> Whenever I'd ring Gordon the last few months, I've always rang him and said, hello, Scotland. And he says, hello, Wales. <laughs> and good actor now, wasn't it? No. No. <laughs> I rang him on Friday. And I was flustered about, hello, uh, 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 Kimmel Bay, and, and we called her. But it is great that you're here permanently, um, and we're looking forward to your ministry. As we're approaching 2022 in Easter, um, a few months ago, Gordon asked me about what have we preached on in the last couple of years. So in the week, I sat down on the computer, and I went through all the ser services for the past year and a half, as far as I got. And if you remember last Last January, we started a series called What is Church? And as I was watching a bit of that service, people had sent in little clips of what they were looking forward to in church. And it was lovely reminiscing. You all looked a year, up, a year younger last year. And people were saying, I can't wait to get back to church to worship together. I'm not going to say who I watched specifically, but there was that excitement about being back in church and worshipping. We didn't manage that last year for Easter, did we? because Easter was cancelled. In the last two years, we've missed out on celebrating Easter. But this year, in 2022, we have something amazing to celebrate, don't we? We have something amazing that the, the God of the universe came down. He died upon the cross. He paid the price for our sins. And he rose again so that we could have freedom, that we could have new life. And I hope you're looking forward to Easter this year. We're having a fun day on the 16th of... There's Joe, founder this time. On the 16th of April, it's a Saturday. And um, we'd like to share that great, amazing good news with the community that we live in. And we're going to have a barbecue. A few years ago, we had a, what was it called, Joe? The table football. The inflatable table football. Inflatable table football, where you get attached into it and you play football against each other. Um, sumo wrestling, barbecue. Would love to invite the whole community but we need people to help set up and take down and do all that stuff so please speak to Jo yep and she's looking for chocolate eggs cream eggs little gift little gift eggs mini eggs if you're available please speak to Joe or Gordon because he'll be here <laughs> um, but yeah looking forward to there's some little cards somewhere Elaine as well some little invites any around they're in the foyer. Take some, invite some of your friends, and um, let's be praying that we can share the amazing hope that we have with the community, with our families, with our friends. And that's it. I'm going to hand over to Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Shall we stand together? Let's pray before we come into worship this morning. Let's stand together, shall we? I don't know where you're standing this morning in terms of your relationship with God. Sometimes we feel like we're standing right next to him, don't we? And other times we can feel like we're quite far off and somewhere in between. And I always think when I come into worship about the Old Testament a temple where there was the outer courts and then there was the inner courts and then there was the holy of holies and um, you know God has made that way isn't he for us to be able to be in the holy of holies with him and I think sometimes we can stand outside of that can't we and we can be very sort of tentative about whether we're allowed to go in or not even as Christians we sometimes have something in our hearts that says oh gosh I can't go in there but God has got arms open wide this morning he wants to welcome us in and whether you're standing outside the door's open. The door is open wide for us to go and stand and enter into the Holy of Holies to be with him this morning, to worship him, to sit on his knee, to bow down before him, 
to sit at his feet. He wants to welcome us in, every single one of us this morning. So let's start our service by seeing how great thou art.
your name on high and we do want to thank you father for the works that you've done in all of our lives father thank you for your salvation thank you that you've set us free thank you that you've restored us thank you that we can have relationship with you and we can enter in to the holy of holies to be with you in your presence lord we just want to give you all the praise and all the glory in jesus name amen if you'd like to take your seats, we're going to watch a short video of what Joe and Sarah and the youth got up to last weekend, so enjoy. Thank you. 
Um, I was just going to say, technology wasn't working. Joe was supposed to be. There was, a, there was a nice fun tune along with it. There was. I told you it wasn't working. Um, before the children, before the children go out, Gordon is going to share about um, something coming up at Easter. So over to this this microphone in a second. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, you're there. That's good. Uh, well, we've arrived. It's great to be here. It's great to be in sunny Wales. Pete keeps telling me it's always sunny, never rains. <laughs> so I'm holding Pete responsible. It's great to be here. Looks like a brilliant weekend, doesn't it? And uh, you got brilliant weather for it as well. Um, anybody here know who Arsene Wenger is? Who is he? Amanda? Football manager. He used to be the manager of Arsenal, didn't he? So we don't talk about him, Connor, do we? But he said something once which was the most profound thing I've heard about Easter. He's not usually quoted in evangelical circles, I'll be honest. But he was talking not about the Christian Easter. He was talking about the football Easter. Those of you that know the football program know that at Christmas time and at Easter time there's a lot of compacted fixtures into the holidays and that was because historically there was a lot of people able to go to the matches so they used to cram in three or four matches in about a week and they still do it over Christmas and Easter and he was being interviewed about that once and he'd come from a completely different culture, completely different football background and once he got the hang of it he said this, he said I've come to, I'll not do it with a French accent. He said, I've come to realize that Christmas is important, but Easter is vital. Oh, and he managed to sum up what theologians have been trying to do for centuries. Christmas is important, but Easter is vital. Vital means life, doesn't it? Full of life. And we want Easter in Kindle Bay in 2022 to be vital, don't we? To be full of life. So we are going to encourage you to explore Easter, maybe in a way that you've not done before, maybe you've done this before. But each morning, yes, morning, people, who's the morning person in the room? One person is going to be here with me, that's great. <laughs> you can put the kettle on if you're here before me. Each morning from Monday to Thursday of Holy Week, so that's a week on Monday, we're going to meet here at 8 o'clock for half an hour, that's all. And what we're going to do is track through Jesus' week chronologically by reading what was happening in the life of Jesus on that day leading up to the cross. So we're going to do that at 8 a.m. here. If you're on your way to work and you just want to drop in for 10 minutes, that's great. If you can stay for the full half hour, that's great. And then also in the evenings from Monday to Thursday, we're going to do the same because there are different things happening in the life of Jesus, but we're going to do that on Zoom. So the morning's here, evening's at Zoom. All you need to remember is 8 o'clock. It's the same in the morning, same in the evening. And we will, my wife and I, we will sponsor anyone who makes it to all eight sessions will get a Turnock's tea cake, all right? <laughs> Bribery and corruption. Starting the way I mean to go on. And then on Good Friday, we're going to meet here at 10.30 and we'll have a short time of communion together as we think about the cross and its implications. Christmas is important, but Easter is vital. Thank you. I think the boys and girls are going to head off now. And don't worry, I'm going with them. I'm not leaving, I'm coming back. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there is so much to pray for in your world at the moment. It is so overwhelming, and we struggle to know where to start. But we know we have a saviour who we can always approach and who listens to the pleas of our hearts. Father, we pray for all those that we know who are bereaved, unwell, in hospital, struggling with many issues. Be their comfort, Lord. We pray for the Ukraine, for peace, Lord. And we pray for all those caught up in the fighting and in the consequences of the devastation being brought upon that nation. Give them strength, Lord, and sustain them, we pray. We pray also for Russia, for those ignorant of the truth and those fighting and suffering. Touch Mr. Putin's heart, Lord, so that he will turn away from this evil path. We pray too for Afghanistan, that the Taliban will allow girls to go back to school 
that they will turn from their evil agenda and respect women. On a lighter note, Lord, we give thanks that our new pastor Gordon and his wife Ali are finally with us. We pray that you will bless them abundantly and bless this church. Give us strength to do your will, Lord, and to share your light in the darkness. Thank you, Father, for all your blessings and your love. Through our precious Saviour. Amen. Let's have a short prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy and your grace towards us. And Lord, we pray that as we come to open your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us. Thank you that your word brings transformation and it brings life into our bodies. And we pray that you would speak to us and help us to listen to what you're saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Lisa, could you just turn off this one, number, the green one? Because when I put it down, it might go ping. Right then, what is Easter to you? Is Easter a weekend off? Is it a, a bank holiday with an extra lie in bed on a Sunday morning? Or is it a time to celebrate that our saviour, the saviour of the world came, he died upon the cross and he's risen from the grave. Don't we have such an amazing event to celebrate? We only have that and we can only develop that because we have this first God's word that teaches us about that, that reveals to us how much God has done for us. And through his word, God communicates his love to each and every one of us and it brings transformation into our lives. Let's never neglect the fact that God speaks to us personally, individually, through his word. And in his word, we find a, a redemption story that right from the beginning of time, when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, God's been at work. God's been putting his plan in place, a redemption story, a bloodline story where he has been winning people back to himself. And that's always been God's plan. And yes, it's God's word that it shows us and it reveals to us the story of the record but let's not forget that God works in the lives of ordinary people like me and like you. God calls, he speaks, and he communicates. And we see him working in the real lives with real meaning and real purpose. I'm just going to move this. It's really getting in my way. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, Lisa, if it's in your way. First slide, please, Elaine, if it's working. Might probably not through <laughs> today's technology. Who can see what um, these are? Row lowers. If you're at the back and you can't see, there is a, there's a, a, a picture. This was a four packet of row lowers. As you can see, there's a pack gone missing. I brought them yesterday and I confess I got I a packet just to check how good they were. Who can remember the marketing strategy from the 80s or 90s? Who can remember what it was? Right, who said that first? I think Steve Lyon said that first. Um, Steve, because there's a lot of COVID around, we're going to put these into quarantine. Come back next week and they're yours. <laughs> Are you diabetic? Yeah. <laughs> Dave, will, Dave will enjoy them. <laughs> um, it, what, can we, can we press play on the little, little advert? For those of you who've never seen it, if it works. Mm -hmm. oh, Where am there. I? On TV. Mm -hmm. She's nice. Who is she? Uh, your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Does she love me? Oh, worships you. Nice, What's she eating? Rolo, my favorite. It's my last one. Oh. But you can have it anyway. <laughs> Do you love anyone enough to give them your last roller? Soft, creamy toffee in a milk chocolate cup. Quick! <laughs> Where am I? On TV. Mm -hmm. She's nice. Who is she? Uh, your girlfriend. Does she love me? Oh, worships you. What's she eating? Rolo? My favourite. It's my last one. Oh. 
but you can have it anyway. <laughs> Do you love anyone enough to give them your last roll of soft, creamy toffee in a milk chocolate cup? Quick, draw a bunch of flowers. I think that's one of the best marketing strategies because we've never forgotten that, have we? You wouldn't want to give up your last Rolo. Uh, a little tip. Am I still on, Lisa? A little tip. If you don't want to share your Rolos, just eat them on your own when nobody else is around and they'll never know, <laughs> like I did yesterday. What's my point? How easy do you find it to give things up or do you want to hold on to them to yourself? Well, this morning we're in Genesis chapter 22. And for those of you that know the passage, there's a connection between my illustration and what God is communicating. And the, the passage is called, God tested Abraham. How do we know that God tested Abraham? Well, verse 1 tells us, sometime later, God tested Abraham. But before we look at the test, the verse starts with some time later, suggesting that there's something happened previously. If you cast your minds back, I'm sure you all know the story, Abraham was, set, was waiting for a child and God promised him, he says, you will have a child through your wife, Sarah, in your old age. Abraham was 75 when he received the promise from God and Abraham believed God. And God, he's called the father of faith because he just believed in God's promise. And in chapter 21, the previous chapter, we see that promise being fulfilled that they had a son and they named him Isaac. And then sometime later, is about, the scholars tell me, between 13 to 27 years later. So Isaac is now, let's say 15, just for um, some context. So he's 15 years old. Isaac, the name means laughter. That's what his name means. So Abraham and Sarah have had 15 years of laughter together. The next slide, please, Elaine. They've had 15 years of joy, of spending time with this promised child that God had promised them. They'd seen him walk for the first time, talking, the joys of being a parent. They would have gone fishing together, Abraham and Isaac. They would have been jumping into lakes and rivers and walking along the beach. I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but they look like they shopped in Gap or, or Next as well with those, with those clothes on. But it would have been double joy because they've waited for so long and God had come through and fulfilled this promise. And then God says to Abra Abraham, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will show you. <gasps> Can you imagine God asking Abraham that? This was the greatest test that Abraham would ever face in his life. But for those of you who don't know the story, God detests human sacrifice, so just bear with me until the end. I remember somebody preached on this years ago and I was sat with Sue at the front and Sue turned to me, she said, how could God ask such a thing? How can he? And because someone was preaching, I couldn't respond, but I was just saying, just wait for the, wait for the sermon. But we have hindsight, we have the New Testament, we know the whole story, but put yourself in Abraham's shoes. What a test. But he is God and he had a purpose. And this chapter is the greatest demonstration of a man's faith in a faithful God. But the question is, does, does God test us the same? Do we get tested by God? James says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I don't think Abraham would have seen this as an opportunity for great joy. Do you? And likewise, when we're going through things in life, it's hard to look at the perspective of things of, of looking at it through great joy. But then James says this, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. Abraham is learning to trust in God, even when he doesn't understand the, the, the detail. He's, he doesn't understand why is God testing me, yet he, he's learning to obey. Obedience comes before understanding. And I've heard many people say over the years, well, I'll become a Christian if I understand this. I'll take a step of faith if I know the reasons behind this and, and that. But God just calls us to have faith, to have faith in his son, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we see that in our Christian lives, faith is matured through the experience of stressful testing that was stretched, and it causes us to grow and to trust in God more. Isaac was the miracle child that was fulfilled God's promise, and he said that all the nations on the earth will be blessed through him. 
He said, you'll have many descendants, as many as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. And he was the gift of God in response to Abraham's faith. And now God is testing that faith. Why is he testing him? Because he's a God of love and he wants to work in our lives. He wants to cause us to grow and to mature, to be strong in our faith, to be strong in our faith in him. We live in a world that's against God. We live in a world that's against living in the Christian way. And God wants us to be strong in that faith. We're called to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Um, you've all heard the saying, no pain and no gain. I, um, I've been going to the gym now. I said to Lisa the other day, for 30 years, um, I started when I was 17 with Auntie Beryl's son, Justin, and we used to go to the gym in college. Do the maths, I'm now 47. And I've learned over the years that no pain, no gain. The more effort you put in, the, the stronger you get. But it's a process. It takes time, it takes dedication, and it, it takes commitment. And it happens over a period of, of years. This was me when I was 21. Um, I, was, I was born in Georgia. I needed the shave, so you might not recognize me in the picture. But the heavier the weights become, the more pain we get. But the more we cause to grow, and it's the same in the physical, as it is in the spiritual, we're called to grow spiritually, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Early the next morning, verse 3 says this, Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. God had asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, the son that he'd longed for, the son that he loves, the son that's brought him so much joy. How does Abraham respond? He obeys. He got up early the next morning. And it's interesting that God just says, go to the region of Moriah. He didn't have the exact location. He didn't have the exact place. He just knew he had to obey God. And he knew that God would guide him on the journey and would reveal to him where he needs to go. I'm not sure about you, but I've been a Christian for 22 years, and I look back, and there's been times when I've not wanted to obey God, because I want to know the details, I want to know the why and the how, and if you're saying this, God, how's that going to happen in the future? God guides when we're moving forward, but he only guides one step at a time. He doesn't give us all the details. We're just called to trust in faith, to trust in his plan. Verse 4 says this, On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he, him, and he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Can you imagine traveling for three days as Abraham did with his only son, the son that he loved? He knew what God had asked him to do. They would have lied down at night time and Isaac would have been chatting away about where are we going? What's it going to be like? Have you been there before? As a, as a young boy would. And Abraham would have listened to him go to sleep every night and then he must have lay there looking at the stars going, Lord, really? How can I do this? How could you ask me? But Abraham believed in God's promise. And then they're travelling up the mountain and Isaac speaks up with a childlike innocence and he says... Father, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham responds in faith. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. God had promised to Isaac that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. Yet Abraham didn't look at the circumstances he was in. He didn't look at the detail. He just trusted in the God that had given him a promise. And God had come through that promise in the past. He hadn't let him down, so he knew that he could trust in him, even though he didn't know the details. And he also trusted him, knowing that even if he did sacrifice his son, that God had the power to raise him up to life again. God had the power to bring resurrection to, to Isaac. When we are facing the unknown, we should always fall back on what we do know. And that's what Abraham did. He fell back on he knew the God of promises. He knew that he could trust in him. And we have a book that reveals God's promises to us. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. He promises to provide for all of our needs 
according to his riches in glory. He promises to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And we're called to walk by faith, not by feeling, not by the circumstances we're in, but we're called to walk by faith. Faith in his love, faith in his provision, faith in his ability to provide, and faith that he has a plan for the future. When they reached the place God told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham's 115, Isaac's 15. There's no chance that he could have overpowered him and suddenly tied him up and laid him on the altar. Isaac was a willing sub submitting to his father's will. He willingly allowed this to happen. And then, as he's lying on the, on the altar, Abraham, he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son and he lifted it up. And then the voice of the angel says, Abraham, Abraham. You can hear the, the urgency in the angel's, in the angel's voice because he knows he was that close to doing it. And what does Abraham say? <gasps> Here I am. What a, what a relief he must have thought. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to, to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Talk about a close call. Abraham was willing to give up. Abraham was willing to obey. He was willing up to give up his best, his most dearest and his closest, his most precious. He must have been one of the most thankful men ever to hear that voice, Abraham, Abraham. But in 2022, as we approach Easter, does God call us to give up our children in a sacrifice? No, he doesn't. But what does he call us to do? Paul answers this question in the New Testament, writing to the early believers in Rome. He says this, Therefore, I urge you, I beg of you, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because God has been so good, because he's been so good to us, he says, offer up your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. We're called to offer worship by offering our lives as a living sacrifice to say, God, here I am. I want to serve you. It's easy to look at the life of Abraham from the outside in and think, what a guy. But the amazing thing is that God calls us to be involved in the story of his redemption plan. He calls us to be involved into sharing hope, into sharing love, into a, a world that desperately needs it. What an amazing privilege that God calls, calls ordinary people like me and you to be part of his plan and to experience his love for ourselves. In God's test to Abraham, he was willing to not hold on to his son, but to give him up. And God was the same. He was willing to give up his precious son. But what do we hold on to? If you've never come to faith in Jesus, maybe you're waiting to, I'll take that step of faith if I know this or if I know that. God calls each of us to take a step of faith. For me, I delayed for so long because I was scared of what people would think about me. I was scared of taking that step of faith because of what my friends and family would say. And I delayed for about five years, but God says to take a step of faith, to taste and see that the Lord is good. When we do take that step of faith, we experience God's Holy Spirit. And I know a thousand percent that he's real and he's risen from the grave. Or perhaps you've given your life to Jesus five, 10, 15 years ago, but you're still holding on to things in your life. You're still holding on to areas of your life that you say, I don't want to give up that area. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your energy. Maybe it's your, your Sunday morning, you like lying in bed, or maybe it's your finances. What's God calling you to give up in, in your life? What's God calling you to say, don't hold on to it. Let it go. Give it to me and let God move through your life. Let God use you by the power of his Holy Spirit. What did Abraham say? He said, here I am, God, willing to obey and willing to offer up his life. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, on, it is called on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Where is this Mount Moriah that it, it was spoken about? Next slide, please, Elaine. 
Mount Moriah is where Solomon built the temple, where for hundreds of years the Jews sacrificed a spotless lamb without blemish for the forgiveness of sins for the nation. But where is the exact place where Abraham went to? The next slide, please. This is Golgotha, Calvary. It's the highest point in the region of Mount Moriah, in the same place where Abraham was about to give up his son. God gave up his son on Calvary. God didn't hold back. He gave up his best so that we could experience God's forgiveness and God's love. Gave up, God gave up his most precious, his only begotten son. He did that because of love. He did that because he loves us unconditionally, more than I can ever communicate, more than we could ever grasp or understand. He loves us more than we can ever understand. And this passage portrays an obedient servant worshipping God in faith, but at great cost. Abraham didn't withhold his son, and neither did God in the same way. Paul said this in the, t in the New Testament, he who did not withhold his son, but, came, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I don't know what your needs are in life, but we have a God who can provide. He doesn't provide because we just obey him. He provides because he loves us, because he has a plan for our futures, regardless of how old we are. Abraham was 100 when he was trusting, trusting in God, and he still had an amazing plan. God has a plan for our futures, for each and every one of us. He has an amazing plan to give us hope, to give us peace, and for him to use us for his glory. I don't know what your needs are this morning. Maybe it's healing, maybe it's forgiveness, maybe it's a new job, maybe it's guidance in life, but we have a God who can provide. We have a God who can meet us in our hearts, and he, he, he provides in his perfect timing. And yes, we can receive physical blessings, but we can receive spiritual blessings. We can receive the Holy Spirit who blesses us more than we can ever know. We can experience new life, new love, and joy in our hearts. Only because God gave up his best for each of us. And he calls us to offer up our lives and to allow him to work through us. Shall we pray? And if the musicians would like to, to join me. As we've got our eyes closed and our hearts are quiet before God, I want to leave some time to reflect and to, and to ponder what God has done for each of us. And as we move into communion, to give us time to give thanks in our hearts, we have a God who knows our thoughts before we even think them. He knows every word that's going to be on our lips. He knows every hair on our head. And this morning, he loves each and every one of us unconditionally. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never taken a step of faith. Can I encourage you of how much Jesus loves you? He went to the cross willingly and he paid the price for our sins. He has a plan for your life and he wants to give you the, the desires of your heart. Can I encourage you to take a step of faith? 22 years ago, I took a step of faith. And millions of people around the world have been in the same position. They've taken a step of faith and they've experienced God's forgiveness, God's love, God's healing in their hearts, the God of all comfort that can draw close to us and set us free so that we can experience his peace. If that's you this morning, if that's you watching online, Take a step of faith. Just speak to Jesus and confess your sins and ask him to come into your heart and you can experience that forgiveness. Or maybe you're here this morning and deep down in, in your heart and in your life, you know that God isn't first, that you've been holding back. What is he saying to you? Like Abraham, God calls us to have faith and to obey and to allow him to work in our lives. If you give God your best. If you honour him, he will honour you. While the musicians are playing this song as we move into communion, 
Can we just listen, keep our seats and just listen to the words and just spend some time speaking to God, asking him to, to move in your life and asking him to give you the courage to step out and to serve him with all of your heart and to give everything over to him. a God who's always had a plan. It was always his plan to send his son, his beloved son, so that we could have forgiveness, so that we could have new life, and that we could follow him. 2,000 years ago, on the same mountain where Isaac carried the wood, Jesus carried the cross, and he went to Calvary. In the same way that Isaac submitted to his father's will, Jesus submitted to his father's will to pay the price for each and every one of us here if we were the only person alive, he would have done exactly the same because he loves each and every one of us. And we come to remember and to give thanks this morning for what he has done. I'm going to ask Gordon to give thanks for the...
Phil, to give thanks for the bread, I think. So we pause in God's presence here today. The same presence that accompanied Abraham on the mountain. The same God, the same God is with us today. Calvary covers it all. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. We're welcoming we're welcoming God's presence. The Lord's table is a time to pause amidst all the activities and concerns that we have and to remember. Remember Calvary, where the price of sin was paid. Calvary covers it all. This morning, as we look to Jesus in faith, all is forgiven. Invite his peace, invite his presence. Maybe the Lord's been putting his finger on something today. What do you need to loosen your grip on? What do you need to, to free yourself from? You'll know, you'll know. We release it into your presence, Father. And the wonderful thing is that just as Abraham and just as the father on Calvary's hill three days later, we will probably receive it again to carry on enjoying, but without the power, without the bonds, without the chains. Thank you, Father, for this bread this morning that reminds us of your death for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given the thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, and let's just hold it for a few seconds and give thanks in our, in our hearts as, uh, as it's served. Let's t take a few moments to give thanks individually for what he's done. ask Gordon now to give thanks for the wine. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again, or perhaps for the first time, that just as the substitute was provided at the right time for Isaac, as he faced imminent death. Lord, we recognize your word teaches us that the, the wages of sin is death, and so we also face that imminent, eternal death. But Lord Jesus, just at the right time, 
you became sin so that we could be free. And Lord, we recognize that there is power in your blood. And as we take the wine which stands today as a symbol of that blood, we recognize that it's your blood and your blood alone that washes us clean, that Calvary does cover it all. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We are in awe of what you have done. And as we take this cup now, we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we distribute the cup, can I ask you to retain it as a sign of our unity in Christ, not just with our brothers and sisters here, but across the world today. And uh, at the right moment, we'll, we'll take it together. But just hold on to it until we take it together. So we say with the, the psalmist, I lift high the cup of salvation. Let us drink and remember the Lord Jesus. Jesus with his disciples. He didn't institute communion so we could become religious. He did it so that we could have freedom, forgiveness and new life in him. Let's close our service this morning and we're going to sing Christ is my reward. Um, I always forget this but I'm not going to forget today. If you'd like to give an offering, there is a plate uh, just on the, on the way out but I know a lot of people give digitally but just a reminder after, after we leave there's tea and coffee as well. Um, and let's pray this week. God, what do you want me to do? How can I serve you? How can I give you my best? Let's give God his, our best this week for his kingdom and for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
enjoy your tea and coffee and we'll see you next week. God bless everyone.